Welcome to Unlocking Your Truth, another podcast by Dr. Leslie Phillips. Welcome, everybody, to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie and with Corey. Hello, everyone. Hi. And uh, you're listening to us on CIVL on 101.7 FM. You can live stream us on CIVL.ca. And you can also catch the podcasts at DrLesliePhillips.com. And there's mucho of them. There is mucho. There certainly is. Enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, hundreds. Um, now, if you're a regular listener, you will know that we like to focus on everything in the realm of metaphysics and spirituality and things that help you in your personal growth. And today we have a fantastic guest. His name is Dr. David James. And he is a transformational hypnotherapist located in Beverly Hills in California. And what I find absolutely fascinating about him is that he used to be a police detective and an Episcopal priest. <laughs> That's just quite the combination. Yes. Not at the same time, but yes. <laughs> as well as being the author of three books on the inner journey. Now, he has a PhD in clinical psychology. He also has degrees in spirituality and human development and considers himself an expert in the mind-body-spirit relationship, which I think is so, so very important in our, in our present time reality. And, uh, you know, so many people um, are either ignoring their, ignoring one or the other and don't have the two in balance. So I'm very glad to have him on the show to be able to talk about that. Now, he works personally with clients and he travels around the United States and Canada doing presentations. And his latest book is called Discovering Your Magnificent Mind, Finding Freedom, Prosperity and Health, All the Things That We All Want. And uh, it was released by Balboa Press, which is part of Hay House. And David is also on the faculty of the University of Philosophical Research in Los Angeles. That's kind of fascinating. I'd be curious what kind of research they do in the realm of philosophy. And, uh, and he's also a very popular guest speaker on radio, television, and uh, at conferences. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's, a, it's our delight to have you this evening, and um, I'm very interested just to start by asking you about your personal journey, um, how, because you, it seems like you've done a lot. <laughs> I being, have. That's, that's why I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> you're sleepy. You're getting sleepy. That's right. <laughs> well, from being a policeman to a priest to an author, to a psychologist, and a hypnotherapist. How did that all happen? How did that unfold? Well, my life has followed a couple twin tracks. Uh, I grew up in a family that was influenced by two powerful people. The first was my father, who was a sergeant on the sheriff's department in Los Angeles. And the other was his sister, my aunt, who was a Roman Catholic nun. And I, she really was my best friend in some ways. And so I spent a lot of my time in convents growing up and summer vacations there. And, uh, and I was telling somebody yesterday that I was really, really disappointed at 10 years of age when I proudly announced to the nuns at dinner one night that I wanted to be a nun too, only to discover there were no men in the convent. <laughs> I, I had never noticed it before that. And so I did the next best thing and became a priest. So, um, but I've always had these kind of twin impulses of, of uh, police work uh, and, and, and spirituality and the human journey as part of my life. 
That's wonderful. And then the, and then the education as a clinical uh, psychologist and mm-hmm. a hypnotherapist and a, co- a cognitive psychologist. Um, what's a cognitive psychologist? Cognitive behavioral therapy is um, a therapy where uh, we work with the presenting problem as it is and try to find solutions very short-term solutions in the sense that, you know, rather than having to do years and years of therapy, we try to in, in, incorporate uh, breath and mindfulness practices and inner dialogue work and those kinds of things, which is what led me to hypnotherapy because hypnotherapy is one of the most powerful tools that I know of to do this kind of work. So it was kind of a stair-stepping experience for me. Mm. And you also do NLP as well. Yes, neuro-linguistic programming, yeah. So do you combine all of those together in your own sort of unique blend? Do you? I do. Yes. I do. Uh-huh. Oh, so tell us more about that. Well, it depends on the need of the client that comes, obviously. Mm-hmm. The number one reason that people come to hypnotherapists, at least in the United States, is they want to stop smoking. Hmm. And then the number two reason people come to hypnotherapists in the United States is because they want to release weight. Uh, we don't call it losing weight in the hypnotherapy world because if you lose something, of course, you try to find it. So we don't use the language, using our NLP background, we don't use the language of losing weight because if you lose your checkbook, you want to find it. If you lose your keys, you want to find it. We talk about releasing weight. So number one is very across the board is people want to stop smoking. Number two, they want to release weight. And then number three, speaking in public, trouble with intimate relationships, trouble managing finances, relationship problems with children, uh, all fear of flying in an airplane. It's, but the number one and two are pretty significantly out there as far as what happens. So uh, if somebody comes to me uh, to want to stop smoking, and that's all they want to do, which is a laudable exercise because it can save their life, uh, then really very simple hypnotherapeutic six sessions and out kinds of things. I have great success with that with helping people quit smoking. If people come because they're depressed and the depression and the conversation reveals, um, you know, that there's trauma involved in their life. That's part of the responsibility of their, of their uh, depression. Uh, Then, you know, we use probably the, you know, any tool in the toolbox to help with it. So like I said, it really depends on what they present with as to what uh, we offer. Okay, well, that makes sense because everyone's unique, aren't they? And uh, um, different people would respond to different things. So, so what do you think it is that makes, that, that sets you apart from other people who might be doing similar work or that makes what you do really transformational and really powerful? Well, um, what sets me apart, I think, in, at least in California, to be a certified hypnotherapist doesn't require advanced uh, education. It's, you know, the Hypnosis Motivation Institute where I went and did my year's internship uh, gives you the certification. But I bring to it, you know, graduate and and doctoral level training in psychology. Um, Also, I have a shamanistic background. I do a lot of work with plant medicines and, yeah, and, um, uh, spiritual past life regressions and uh, entity releases and, and various things. So I, not, not to toot my horn, you know, but just to say that I, I have a depth of experience and practice that some folks don't have. And that's yeah. probably, yeah. yeah. So it, sound, it looks like Corey's has a question. Oh yeah, more or less. Yes. Uh, you mentioned you studied NLP. Richard Bandler was uh, one of the co-founders of NLP. He used used the same term you used was a uh, toolbox or tool belt. If you only have one tool in your tool belt and somebody comes to you and you can't use that tool, then you're sort of out of luck and they're out of luck as well. And right. It sounds like you've got a really full rounded, if you want to call it a full, fully full toolbox of, of, of uh, tools <laughs> I can have a better word. They can use with individuals. I think I think that's wonderful because most healers uh, don't, you know, they'll, they'll prescribe to one healing technique, not understanding that that doesn't always reach people. So your your hypnosis um, itself, 
uh, is, is that an Erickson-based hypnosis or is it the same type of hypnosis that uh, Richard Bandler practiced? Or? It's it, the, the style is called Capucinian hypnosis, which would mean nothing to somebody outside the field. Um, uh, but it's really sensory based. It really is connecting with the experience of the mind and the body at the moment what the client is feeling in their body as well as what's going on in their mind when I put them into trance state. Um, and again, you know, I started very straight as it were, I started very clinical uh, and I've continued to expand out. I expanded out into hypnotherapy training and NLP training. And then I expanded out into shamanic practices and, you know, I'm getting wilder, I guess, as I get older, I'm not quite sure, but um, yeah, it, it, for any therapy, in my opinion, to be, as effective as it can be, it has to take really body, soul, and spirit into account. And um, so that's kind of the, the method that I use. Yeah, I, I've always used uh, uh, MEPS. I've always looked at MEPS, mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual, because like a table, if one of those is off, uh, you're going to get a little wobbly life. Yeah, the, the old three-legged stool, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it sounds like uh, what you do spans quite a broad range from the, what, what, what one might call the conventional mm -hmm. therapy to what one might call more less conventional. So the entity removal and um, and and that kind of stuff. That that I would uh, you know the more conventional practitioners and hy hypnotherapists and psychologists might not even recognize such a thing as there being entities that people could get invaded by. Exactly. Um, now, I mean, I, I kind of work at both ends of the spectrum as well. And I, I'm just curious for other people that do how, how you, how that goes down when you present that to the world. And maybe because you live in Beverly Hills, it doesn't, it's okay. Maybe it goes down. <laughs> <laughs> do you find that, do you, do you find that um, difficult to be in the conventional and unconventional at the same time? How does that work? I um, always present really straight. I always present very conventional to my clients. Um, and then as we get into the work, if I see, where alternative kinds of therapies, modalities would help. I mean, I do, you know, energy work similar to Reiki, but not. Mm -hmm. um, I do a more shamanic based energy work. Um, if I see that that is a helpful option, then I offer that. But like I said, especially, you know, because again, I, I, in the United States, especially, so much about hypnosis is, has been viewed originally through stage shows, people barking like dogs, cracking like ducks, you know, pretending to pass out. I mean, I was trained in all that. Uh, but you really have to demystify some of the stage processes for people. So, you know, if I put on the door, David James, hypnosis, uh, expeller of demons, and um, <laughs> traveler in the astral, uh, you know, I might not get people in. Uh, whereas, you know, if, if you start conservative, so to speak, and then if people feel safe, then you can move them into the next step. Were you trained in exorcism when you were a priest? Well, that's part of it. But I learned it more in my sh Brazilian shamanic practices um, through entity removal and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Well, what's the most difficult client that you've had that was um, possessed by entities? I'm always curious because I've been having a few a few of those lately. So. <laughs> Have we got a client for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let me see if I can kind of rearrange some of this to protect their privacy. Um, okay. uh, it, it was an abuse victim, oh, okay. somebody, a victim of ritual sexual childhood abuse. Yeah. And um, at first I thought we were dealing with dissociative identity disorders, what we used to call multiple personality disorders. Yeah. Um, but then as I got into the, I, I put the subject into, I put the client into hypnotic trance and we start going deep into their mind and all of a sudden somebody else is looking out through their eyes at me. Now, uh, you know, in the traditional Christian view of um, this work, you know, entities, 
especially, you know, what we consider quote unquote bad entities, demonic, would be the bad guys. You know, they are um, evil from hell, trying to take us back to hell. But again, the Santo Daime work that I've done, uh, the Brazilian work that I've done, really helped me see a new way. It's Umban Daime way. It's, it sees that uh, these entities are just lower energies that have not progressed along their path of um, uh, humanity that we have. You know, we're ahead of them. And so when you see it that way, it takes a lot of the fear out because all of a sudden you're not looking at spinning heads and split pea soup necessarily. But instead what you're looking at is a lower and frankly dumber energy that is trying to take over the body. I was talking again yesterday to somebody about the three most common afflictions to humanity from the spirit world. And those are mocking spirits, vicious spirits, and hungry ghosts. And all three of those have a particular line of assault but the, the purpose is to, to feed off of our negative emotions to, to uh, enable themselves. So with this particular client, when I realized what it was, I mean, it, it, it was, um, you know, it's funny because I have an office in a medical clinic here in Beverly Hills. And I have a psychiatrist on one side and a nurse practitioner on the other side. And then two internal medicine doctors down the hall. And sometimes I wonder what they think is going on when they hear what's coming out of my office. Yeah. You know, with the screaming or, and I would just tell, I'll stick my head out the door and say, gestalt, and close the door. <laughs> because again, that's what the medical professionals can understand. Yeah. So, um, but it really is not so much a matter of, of difficulty as recognizing what the energy is in its own sake and then offering it the opportunity to travel into the light or, you know, if you need to call on angelic help from the heavenly court. Michael, the archangel, and, and all the guardians, then you can do that. Mm -hmm. But it really is when you recognize that what you're dealing with are undeveloped um, energetic sources. It takes away some of the woo-woo scariness of it. Mm. Have you ever had a client who was attached to, to um, his or her attachments? Yes. Mm. That's, that's probably more common than we think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not willing to let go of them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because you know it's 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 horrible, but it's familiar. Yeah. Yeah. I find when when uh, when when a client or a subject does that, they sort of leave. They, it's like leaving the door open, and and they they can want some some entities out, and but yet if there's a revolving door, it doesn't it doesn't serve them. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why it always you know it's, of course it's good to help them understand the issues of roots and the various places of attachments in the body where entities can, can connect. Um, but I mean, I, I've had clients say, yeah, I really need to, I need to let this go. Whatever the, whatever the, this is. Um, and I say, yeah, but do you want to? Cause there's a huge mm. cognitive and perceptual leaf between needing to let something go and wanting to let something go. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's like the sorry, Lisa. It's it's like the difference between looking for a cure and looking for a healing. Yeah. Mm. There, there's definitely a difference between the two. One spiritual, one's physical. Yeah. Well, this is turning out to be an absolutely fascinating conversation. We're going to take a short break. Listeners, you're look, listening to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie and Corey. And this evening's guest is Dr. David James. And uh, he has a, a very broad sweep of expertise, which we've been picking his brains about. And we're going to be back after these few short messages. <laughs> Welcome back, listeners. You are tuning in to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie and Corey. We are broadcasting on CIVL on 101.7 FM across the Fraser Valley. You can live stream us from anywhere in the world on CIVL.ca and you can catch the podcast on drlesliephillips.com. And uh, you're also welcome to send your questions in, listeners, to info at drlesliephillips.com. As you know, every other week um, we interview a guest, which is what we're doing this evening, but we also have time to answer your questions. So do write to us at info at drlesliephillips.com. 
So we're back with Dr. David James, and we were having a fascinating conversation about entities and entity attachments before we went to the break. Now, um, I wouldn't mind switching. I could go. I could talk about that the whole thing, but um, <laughs> I think I think it would be a good idea to maybe switch topics a little bit. And um, I'm I'm interested in. I'm very much interested in the fact that you're both in the more scientific realm and what we might call the more alternative realm. And um, so I was hoping to pick your brains a little bit as well about the scientific research that backs up hypnosis, but also um, in your bio, it said that you are on the faculty of philosophical research. So I'd also mm -hmm. be interested in, in finding out a little bit more about the philosophical research too, and what that's about. Yeah, well, that's kind of a generic name that was given to the Institute back when it was founded in the 40s. Mm -hmm. um, and it was that um, trying to understand the broad swath of human thinking, hence mm -hmm. philosophy, and research into that. I see. Uh, it's, it's very... Um, heavily uh, oriented towards um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, psychology and uh, Joseph Bliff's, I mean, Joseph Campbell kinds of experiences um, and understanding cultural anthropology and mythology. It's a fascinating place. Yeah. But it, the, the name is a little dated because if you talked about philosophical research when it was founded, I think the general assumption would have been that it would have been a much longer, broader, rather, uh, body of research. And so it's taken off in that regard, and the name kind of is still a relic of the, the period. I see. Well, well tell us about um, the scientific research that's been done with respect to hypnosis. And also, this has made it maybe not quite a connected question, but can anybody be hypnotized? Um, I wanted to ask that because it's funny in my work, I, I, I do a lot of intuitive work and I go into a trance state myself so that I can see uh, non-physical reality in, in my clients. Um, but I've always felt if somebody else tried to put me in a trance, they wouldn't be able to. I can put my, I choose to put myself into one. But, um, and so I'm, I'm interested in, can anybody be hypnotized by somebody else? How about that? Anybody can be hypnotized that wants to be. Mm. You know, if, if a client comes to me, crosses their arms over their, uh, their chest, and, you know, points a finger at me and says, you know, Dr. James, there's no way that you're going to hypnotize me. I say, you know what? You're absolutely right. Yeah. Because hypnosis is really, it's such a voluntary process. You know, it's, it is, um, one, one person described it as being uh, the sense of deep relaxation and focused attention. Mm. And as that happens, we begin to access the subconscious mind. We begin to go into trance state. Trance is a, hypnotic trance is a normal and natural phenomenon we're in and out of it all day long if we're at a movie uh watching the theater at the theater watching a movie and um all of a sudden the movie theater darkens and the show comes up and within 10 minutes we're laughing or we're crying mm -hmm. uh we are in the you know if you were to attach brain waves you would see exactly the same brain waves as the hypnotic state so because when you're absorbed in the moment you're in the hypnotic state and like matter, also, if you're driving home from the theater and you're thinking about the movie mm. and remembering, you know, the parts of, you know, that were particularly poignant or powerful or erotic or beautiful, and you realize that suddenly you've pulled into your driveway and somehow you didn't pay attention to the last three red lights or two traffic lanes, but you got home safely, it's because you were in a hypnotic trance and your subconscious mind was driving you. So... You know, the more that you help people see that this is a no hypnosis is a normal and natural state on the spectrum of consciousness, mm. and you demystify the barking of the dog, the cracking of the duck, you know, the secret mind control, the implanting, the CIA, you know, all those kinds of things, yeah. then people are able to more likely be able to do it. Now, you know, Stanford has done a lot of research. Stanford University has done a lot of research, and Harvard Medical School also on hypnosis. And what they found is that people who have 
uh, brain damage in their frontal lobe have difficulty being hypnotized because <laughs> hypnosis works with the executive function of the brain. Mm. Uh, but other than that, unless somebody is under the influence of some kind of drug, uh, if they want to be hypnotized, generally with a skilled hip, hip, hypnotherapist, they're able to. Mm. That's really uh, interesting. Sorry, Corey. Uh, um, but, but I just wanted to say, just follow on from one thing I said before, which is, I think the trance state that some, listening to your description of it, the trance state that somebody enters into via hypnosis is different than the trance state that I'm entering into in order to see non-physical reality. Uh, I don't know if that's true, at least in my experience, because I, I was telling somebody again this week, a, a full day for me at work is five clients a day, and that's five very intense hours. Because with each of my clients, I go into trance state with them. And sometimes I enter into their trance state with them by, I don't want to sound Vulcan, but doing a mind meld mm. and uh, being able to see what's going on with them. So, you know, I think, again, it's up to the, the practitioner and their experience, but um, trance state is, is part, like I said, is part of the normal spectrum of consciousness. And, um, you know, we, we can teach clients to, in trans state, con be in touch with their higher self, Akashic records, mm -hmm. uh, and all that. Um, so I, I just would, I would personally not differentiate in trans states per se. Mm -hmm. I, I would just say that it is what it is, and we teach people how to work with it from there. Okay. You know, I, I, I love, I actually love the simplicity of hypnosis. Um, I've always looked at hypnosis as, helping a person reach into their subconscious to allow their subconscious to bring alternate, alternate ways of doing specific things. For instance, with phobias, as opposed to being afraid of going up in an elevator to be able just to choose not being afraid to go up in an elevator because your, your consciousness does have the ability to make those differentiations and it, it's just being able to, uh, to attach one stronger than the other to that person's psyche. Well, that's true. You know, Joseph Murphy was a very popular speaker in the 60s here in Los Angeles and uh, one of the pioneers in kind of the mind-body connection. Um, and, and he said, and it's really been proven over the years, that the mind accepts the strongest of two ideas in any given moment. So um, we know that the conscious mind is between eight and 12% of the total mind power and the subconscious mind is the, is the powerhouse. That's where emotion and habit and life script and, and memories and physiology all are, 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 are managed and manifested. So um, if you can um, access the stronger energy to make the suggestion of the, the desired change, then the mind accepts it. Exactly. And uh, it's, I found, uh, again, in, in studying Richard Bandler a little, little bit, I, I love what he used to say. He says, uh, yeah, I have people come to see me uh, book an hour session and I just don't know what to do with the other 55 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, he has, uh, his phobia cures are fast. And a lot of people have said they don't stick, but I disagree. I think, I think, giving that person that option or allowing that person to understand they have that option and to, as you say, bring forth the stronger option, sometimes changing the strength of that option is, or that thought or that innermost thought is, is a little bit of the difficult part, but it can be done. And I think it can be done with anyone because everybody can be hip, hypnotized to the negative. If you want to call it, if you want to call it that, like, if I don't get to work on time, I'm going to get fired. You know, like that you can have a boss that, that, that hypnotizes them into believing one transgression of being late is, is the end of their career. And we're all hypnotized on a daily basis in one way, shape or form. Well, and certainly Eric Erickson, who was one of the pioneers in hypnotic work said that everyone is walking around in a trance of disempowerment. Our job is to get them out of that into empowering trances. So, yeah. yeah. Well, um, 
tell us a bit, David, about your latest book, which I believe is called Discovering Your Magnificent Mind, Finding Freedom, Prosperity and Health. So what, what as do opposed you... to that, uh, sorry, as opposed to the uncle on Peter Pan, who's looking for his marbles he lost, right? <laughs> Leslie said, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> That's in the Peter Pan movie. It's just, I, the uncle keeps looking for, I've lost my marbles. I've lost my marbles. <laughs> Everybody thinking, meaning his marbles up here, but it's actually, he actually lost his marbles. I know, yeah. Sorry. A little, little, little humor there. Or a little yeah, attempt. Very little, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to cry. <laughs> oh, very good. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. So we were asking about your book. Yes. It is um, published by Balboa Press, which is a division of Hay House, which is the largest metaphysical publisher and, and self-help publisher in the world. It is literally 100 pages long. And I intentionally wrote it to be a very fast-paced read because people, as a rule, do not read anymore. It's a man's yeah. book. Yeah. If I had published a 500 page with footnotes and annotations and diagrams, you know, it, it would make a lovely bookend for somebody's uh, cooking pots, you know, or something. So um, I wrote a, a book that is, somebody once asked me, why did I write it? And I said, because not everybody can come to Beverly Hills and work with me. Or they, I, I do a lot of Skype hypnosis too, but, um, and, and so in eight easy chapters, I talk about the foundations of understanding how the mind works. Uh, and then I spend a, uh, quite a bit of time for the size of the book on the mind body connection with the placebo effect and using the mind to heal the body. Uh, and then uh, we go into uh, strategies for using the mind to accomplish our goals, our dreams to release blocks, the things that are keeping us from realizing the kinds of things that we'd like to have in our life, and then doing some meditation parts in the practice too. So what's your favorite strategy or strategies that you talk about in the book? Um, relaxation. You know, very often what I do, I do a lot of radio and television, and very often the host will say, okay, can you give us a Closing suggestion, a practice that we might do. And I say, yeah, relax. And they look at me at first sometimes, or you can hear the wheels turning. And I said, again, we know from, from science that relaxation is crucial to the optimum functioning of the human body. I said, because the central nervous system has two parts to it. When you're stressed, anxious, worried, you know, we've activated the sympathetic nervous system, that which we typically tend to call the fight or flight syndrome. And when that's in, in play, then um, cortisol and adrenaline are pumping through the body. Our blood flow is, is going to our limbs, our heart's racing, our eyes are, are, uh, are pinpointed. Uh, and so that works well when we're trying to decide whether we want to fight or saber with two tiger or run from him. But uh, it looks like biologically we were designed to have this particular part of our central nervous system either turned on or off. But what modern day life has done to us is that our anxiety levels seem to be on a slow burn all the time, like a pilot light in a hot water heater. So as a result, we are, uh, pretty consistently dosing ourselves with adrenaline and cortisol and all the kinds of things that inhibit us from creativity and from um, love and from beauty. Because when you're fighting for your life, you're not thinking about the theory of everything. You know, or when you're running from gang members, you're not thinking about what my next meal is going to be. You're thinking, maybe I'll even have a next meal. I don't know. But then when you learn to relax and deeply relax, hypnotically trance state relaxation, um, you activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is part of the central nervous system, and that releases endorphins like oxytocin and other kinds of endorphins and hormones that cause us to relax. When that happens, our blood flow returns to normal, our soft tissue becomes more contiguous, uh, our, our eyes become more reflective to light, 
And instead of the fight or flight, this particular mode is called the feed or breed. Because again, it's hard to do both of those when you're terrified. So when you are in this very relaxed state, creativity abounds because different parts of the brain are, can devote themselves to a creative endeavors and actions. That's why as a, as a meditation, TM is so good because it helps uh, activate this relaxation response, which is another name that's been given to it. So uh, sometimes people seem a little disappointed when they ask me what particular kinds of um, hypnotic practices I recommend, and they're a little disappointed when I say, yeah, learn to relax. But that is literally the best thing to do for us. You won't find any argument from us on that. Um, we both Not at all. we both teach meditation. We push we push the practice of meditation very much on our radio show, and um, you know, to me, it's the it's the panacea for um, stress and anxiety, and it's also the way that you open to your higher mind or your inner awareness or your intuitive gifts, whatever name you would like to give them. So, um, absolutely, we're we're concurrent with you there. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. So I think we might take another I, I, break. Oh. oh, sorry. I was going to say, I think we might take another break. Um, and and uh, can you hold that question till after the break? And, uh, I can. Good. We'll, well, we'll ask it straight <laughs> after the break. And listeners, you've been listening to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie and Corey and with today's guest, Dr. David James, who is a transformational hypnotherapist from Beverly Hills. And we're having a very fascinating, broad-ranging discussion all the way from hypnosis to quit smoking to the expulsion of invasive beings. <laughs> we will be back. We will be back after these messages. Welcome back, listeners. You're tuning in to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie and with Corey. We are broadcasting on 101.7 FM across the Fraser Valley, and you can live stream us on civl.ca. Catch the podcast at drlesliephillips.com and send us in your comments and questions to info at drlesliephillips.com. So before the break, Corey was poised to ask uh, David a question. What, what did you want and, to ask? <laughs> and then luckily, luckily, I, uh, I remember. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, we were, we were talking about um, uh, trance and relaxing. And I just, when I do guided meditations. And my guided meditations are a mixture of meditation and a form of hypnosis at the same time. And I just enjoy doing mm -hmm. it in front of groups of people. I, I watch them and I, I actually do the same you do. I, I travel through that meditation with them. And so they come out the other end and they come up to me. I've never been so deep in my whole life. I'm so relaxed. And it's so wonderful to be able to help people in that manner. And so you also teach mindfulness. I think you were mentioning at the beginning mm -hmm. of the uh, of the present of the, the show. Can you expound on that just a little bit? Well, mindfulness is a meditation practice, um, officially. You know, it's Vipassana in the Thai tradition, the, Buddha, the Thailand Buddhist tradition, Vipassana meditation. And I teach it on Wednesday nights in, here in the San Fernando Valley to a, a group of my followers. But mindfulness meditation, rather than um, trying to go into the past or into the future or even ignore, you know, there are some meditation techniques where we basically don't pay any attention whatsoever to the thoughts. We just focus on our breath in and out, in and out, in and out. Mindfulness expands that in and out kind of breath attention, but also brings our cognitive connection to it so that we are able to say, okay, what I'm experiencing in this moment is anger, rage, love, beauty, um, uh, and uh, the triggers of that can be this, but, or, or the understanding of why I feel this way might come to us. But mindfulness just asks us to be just that, to experience what we're experiencing in the moment, not to try to meditate it away, not to try to explain it away, but to be present in this moment with what is. Mm -hmm. 
And as we do that, then uh, we are able to, again, broaden our perceptual base, our understanding of um, our, our human experience. Yes, it's, it's like a lot of the gurus say, yes, you have a lot of thoughts, but you don't have to act on them. Just watch right. them come in and watch them go out. Right. And so you become aware of these thoughts. You know, I mean, a, a very popular Buddhist image is that the mind is the sky and the thoughts are the clouds that are just going across, or the mind is the river and the thoughts are the leaves floating down the river that you don't pay attention to, but you don't ignore them either. You just say, okay, oh, in this moment, I'm feeling chest pain, or in this moment, I'm feeling blissful. You know, so in other words, you try to connect what's going on in this moment with your perception of what's going on in this moment. You, we're actually way more disconnected. The average person is way more disconnected from our perceptual understanding of what's going on than, than we're used to. So, mm -hmm. True. So... What you're talking about reminds me of, um, actually, we've been doing a series on meditation the last little while. So this, this, this interview will fit in quite nicely with that. Um, I do corporate meditation workshops as well as, you know, like you do, um, mm -hmm. people who want to learn to meditate. And uh, it just reminded me a little bit of um, a workshop I taught last week where exactly what you're saying people were not connected with their bodies and when they started coming into their bodies they couldn't believe what they were finding there they've been ignoring themselves really in order to um to get things done in order to be a leader and i know one of the things that you talk about is the use of um hypnotherapy and the work that you do to help people be more successful and maybe you could talk a little bit about that because I think most people when they're driving after success are in a way may not are not really doing it in a very balanced way and they're not doing it with that um, uh, body mind spirit balance that we were talking about at the beginning of the show well one of the things that that we do in the pre therapeutic interview is help people clearly identify what it means to be a success because I don't know, you know, here in, in the United States and Canada, it seems like we all want to be successful, you know, and that for many people that means multiple millions of dollars or a celebrity. I mean, not everybody, but that's kind of a caricature. So um, whereas for Mother Teresa, for example, success was, was bringing the poor and dying into their homes to care for them until they passed. So the first thing we have to do is understand what it is that we want when we say we want to be successful. Uh, because uh, as I said earlier in the subconscious mind, all of our life scripts and our emotions and our habits of thought are in the subconscious mind. And so if you are saying, for example, that I want to be a multiple millionaire, but you grew up in a religious home where in your family you were taught the verse that's been misused in the Bible that says that money is the root of all evil, then you have a conflict between your desire and your programming. You want to have multiple millions for whatever reason that you do, but your programming says that that's wrong. And again, back to the subconscious mind, only expecting the law, the stronger of two thoughts. So we have to first understand what it means to, when we say we want to be successful. Mm -hmm. And most people perhaps are operating from programming that, that's external programming from the culture and other exactly. people. And yeah. they're not in touch with what, what it really is for them. And, right. And also, the, the, there's a difference in, with, with regard to that. There's a big difference between being rich and being financially free and right. people think they have to be these multimillionaires, as you say in order to be financially free but they don't no i mean you know gandhi was financially free and didn't own anything exactly so yeah like i said so it's really important to under help them understand what success means to them yeah. because it has to mean it to them i mean not to me or to you or to any of us because we're dealing with their programming and you're right in in our culture 
uh, again, it's the yacht and the, you know, the Mercedes and all these that are kind of the stereotypical symbols of success. But, you know, for some people, success might truly be working as a nurse and, um, and, and helping people in hospice. I mean, it just, it so it depends. So once you get this kind of old fashioned values clarification out of the way, so they understand what success is, then you start the conversation about why they're not, why do they think that they're not successful yet? Mm. And that's when you start getting in touch with the kinds of energetic and emotional and, and mental blocks that somebody might have. Like I said, if you grow up, uh, in a house that teaches you that money's evil, uh, then that's going to be a block to it. Uh, if you are raised, if, if one of the pillars of your success model is that you can uh, sexually enjoy your, your partner or partners or whatever it is, but again, you grew up in a family or religious environment that says that sex is only for somebody you marry once in your life, then there's going to be conflict. So, we begin to understand what the blocks are, the psychological, the mental, and the emotional and psychological blocks are to success. And then we start crafting the hypnotic strategy around helping uh, relieve that. You know, the, the, the conscious mind speaks in discursive language like we're using right now, the 10% mind. We happen to be speaking in English, but it could be Chinese or, Israel, or Hebrew or, or um, French. Uh, Whereas the subconscious mind speaks in images and feelings, images and feelings. That's why our dreams are about flying poodles and pizzas with daffodils sticking out of them and all kinds of things that we don't understand that we have to do dream work and unpack because that's the subconscious mind speaking. That's why great art touches us so deeply and great music because they're all symbolic connections with the subconscious mind. So we have to then work with the client to help them, discover what the kind of symbolic images of their success would be so we can then put them in state and feed that to the to the subconscious mind because once the subconscious mind accepts that suggestion then the the change can happen and yeah, that's why dealing in imagery is so strong with with uh with clients because when right. you do image you you do get straight through which is mm -hmm. which is wonderful yeah, because that's the language of the powerhouse. I think that's the language of the, of the subconscious mind is image and feeling. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. Um, so, let me see what to ask you about next. We're actually coming close to the end of the show, so maybe now is a really good time for our, for you to tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you. My website is one word, David James Hypnosis, D-A-V-I-D-J-A-M-E-S-H-Y-P-N-O-S-I-S.com. On my website, you I have some articles and some videos about hypnosis going into the things that we talked about today in a little bit more depth. I talked about the various services I offer. I talked about the Skype work that I do. I have clients in Paris, Dubai, and Rio de Janeiro right now that I'm currently working with by Skype. Um, and so that information can be found at davidjameshypnosis.com. That's wonderful. And if they wanted, um, and, and we talked about one of your books, uh, what are the other two books? And if they wanted a, just a, a, a quick flavor, which, which book would you recommend? For, for the work that we've talked about today, it's my newest book, Discovering Your Magnificent Mind. The other two books I wrote when I was a priest, and they're both on the spiritual life of men. One is called What Are They Saying About Men's Spirituality by Paulus Press, and then the second one was called Sacred Vision, A Man's Legacy, about helping a man understand his own authentic kinds of impulses that then can make a difference in the lives of the next generation. But for this work, for understanding the magnificent mind, it would be this book. Mm. Yes, that would be a whole other fascinating show, um, the spirituality of men. I think when we first started, Corey did a show on that. Um, mm -hmm. And it's because it's interesting. I mean, I know I've noticed in my own practice that um, I get in my classes probably 90% female. But in the one-on-one -on -one work, mm -hmm. I get... 30 to 35 percent male and that's kind of fascinating to me it seems like the men prefer 
to do do it in private. <laughs> I don't know whether that's your experience. <sighs> well, again, because, you know, our cultural image of masculinity is strong and self-sufficient. And, of course, to undertake the spiritual journey is to step into vulnerability and release and healing. And so I could see why men would be drawn to doing this work individually. I have probably half my clientele right now are men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had, I had an instance, I was away on a, on a weekend with 150 men and men's, if you want to call it a spiritual retreat, not religious, but spiritual. And we had a gentleman standing up in the front and he, he was burying his soul. And he says, you know, Almost every day I wake up, at some point during that day, I feel like I'm going to get caught because I'm faking my way through my life. Yeah, and very common. Says, yeah. yeah, and he says, how many people, exactly, and like I, I associated with that. I said, wow, that's how I feel because that's how I felt at work at the time. Mm -hmm. And he says, so how many of you feel that? 150 hands went up. It was incredible, the the strength of the understanding that, and that was, a that was a changing point in my life. I realized I was no different, in, in essence, than to most of these men with the same fragility that they had. Yeah, and we just don't allow our boys to live that out, to understand that. And so we bring into masculinity this very toxic image of manhood, and uh, it doesn't serve us well. No. Hmm. I think, I, I mean, I'd like to do a sh I think I'd like to do a show on that again at some point. I think yeah. that that would be a really cool show to do. You're welcome. I've done a lot of work with this. I've, I've led retreats up in Toronto and North, up in North Bay with men in the wilderness and um, as well as the more traditional church settings. So we can maybe have that conversation if you ever like. Mm. That, that's great. So um, listeners, you've been listening to Unlocking Your Truth with Dr. Leslie. I want to say a really a big thank you to our guest this evening, Dr. David James, who who's helped us pack this evening's show with an enormous amount of information, which I hope that you have, in, will in, have enjoyed unraveling and listening to, and I hope that it has stimulated you and helped you to grow. Now I'm going to count backwards from three, two, one, zero. <laughs> and you're all happy and remember the show. <laughs> <laughs> and you're all buying the book. Yes. I used to said that before I did the three, two, one. <laughs> yeah, Amazon. Barnes and Noble, get it also on my website. Wonderful. So we'll be back here next Tuesday at seven o'clock uh, on civl.ca. And once again, uh, you can find out more about Dr. David James at davidjameshypnosis.com. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Bye, all. Bye. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to another Unlocking Your Truth podcast by Dr. Leslie Phillips. For more information, go to her website at drleslieyphillips.com. That's drlesliephillips.com, where you can ask questions or send her an email. And there's many free gifts on there for you as well. You can also find the questions that were asked during this show at the website on our free card reading podcast page where you'll find a full list of them. Come back again.